So in this lesson, we're talking about finding equations of lines. So here is the first equation of a line that your textbook gives. It says if a, b, and c are constants with a and b both not zero and x and y are variables, then the graph of this equation is a line. Is that the equation that you guys are used to associating with a line? Not at all, right? If, if I say line, you say y equals mx plus b, right? And the reason that we have this formula, like in addition to that one, is because this one also accounts for vertical lines. y equals mx plus b form doesn't account for vertical lines because they have undefined slope. Okay, so I'll show you how it's the same, okay? So the way that it's the same is you can take this ax plus by plus equals c formula, and you can get the y by itself. Does that idea make sense? You do that by first doing what? Subtracting ax. Subtracting ax. So by equals negative ax plus c. And then what would you do? Divide by b. Divide by b. And y would equal negative a over bx plus c over b. And this looks more like y equals mx plus b, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you also see that one problem that arises here is if that b is equal to zero? Yeah. If b is equal to zero, you have two undefined terms on D, F, I, N, E, D. Math teacher can't spell. And if b equals zero, you get the line ax equals c. Or x equals c over a, which is actually a vertical line of undefined slope. So that is why this form exists, because it's general enough that it accounts for all, every single kind of line, whereas this y equals mx plus b form doesn't account for vertical lines. That's the technicality. But y equals mx plus b is by far the most common one. I mean, it's just this one also exists. And did I call it, I don't know if I gave it this name, but some books call this standard form. I don't know why they do that, because by, it's true that slope intercept is by far like more standardly used, but this one just calls standard form. It's easy as one, two, three, sorry, yes. That would be if b could equal zero. And b could be, if b being zero is the reason that this has a problem. So, I mean, b, it, b can be zero. So I don't know why both not zero. That's actually not necessary. Oh, maybe what I meant, and if I didn't say it right, it's possible. Maybe I meant that a and b are not simultaneously zero. Does that difference make sense back in the first slide? So if they're not both zero, I think what the language meant there is that A and B are not both zero at the same time. But it shouldn't matter, right? Because you can't divide by zero. Even if A is like, you know, whatever number. Sure, certainly. But the point is, is that slopes that, they're all, it also is the case that this expression is a line if b or a is zero, like individually. It's just that the case that when b is zero can't be written in slope-intercept form. That's the difference. Okay, so one great trick for graphing, and this applies to other graphs, not just lines, is using intercepts. Like, they're really important features of your graph, and if you can find them, you should. So the points where the graph crosses the, x, graph crosses the x-axis, what are those called? Those are the x-intercepts, and so think about if you have a graph that crosses your x-axis, what do you know about that point? What, what happens? Y is equal to zero. Yeah, y is equal to zero. So you can use the fact that y must be zero to figure out your x-intercepts. That's your clue. And this graph, so the point where it crosses the y-axis, that's called the y-intercept, and these occur when x equals zero. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so graph these lines using intercepts. So first, let's find the x-intercept. 
by plugging in 0 for y. So that's going to give us 3x equals 12. Does that make sense? Some people call that the cover-up method because you can just cover up the y term like it's not there, right? And so you get x equals 4. four. And that's the ordered pair 4 comma 0, right? So over 4 up nothing. And then how about the y-intercept? You plug in... 0 for x. Mm -hmm. And you get negative 4y equals 12. And what's your y value in that case? Negative 3. So that's the point 0 comma negative 3. Okay, and so there's your line. Um, when will that work out well, and when will that not work out well? So it worked out well here because when we plugged in 0 for the y, you could divide 12 by 3, right? And also when you plug in 0 for x, you can divide 12 by negative 4. Does that make sense? So if the constant you have wasn't divisible by one of those two numbers, this method is it's going to give you a, a fractional kind of number, that's all. Just not as pretty. Okay, how about this one? So x-intercept, plug in 0 for y, you get 2x equals 6, and your value for x is... Come on! Three. Here we go! What is that as an ordered pair? Three. Comma? Zero, right? Yeah. Okay. So over 3 up nothing. How about the y-intercept? Almost, 3y equals 6. And so y equals, mm -hmm, that's the ordered pair, 0, comma, 2. I don't think Alex makes you write those things as ordered pairs like I was doing, but I found that if I didn't do that, sometimes students said, oh, it's 3, 2. Is that right? Is the point 3, 2 on that graph at all? No, they're two separate points, right? So, okay. So, intercept thing, great trick. Is there a form that isn't um, two ordered pairs that shows a, uh, two different points? Like, is there a form that's two where ordered pairs? you assume pairs? like x is zero and you assume y is zero. As in simultaneously? Yes. Oh, 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 okay, I think, okay, yep, yep, yep. If your graph goes through the origin, the x and y intercepts are both going to be 0, 0. Mm -hmm. So that, in that case, this method wouldn't be very good. So for example, get something like x plus 2y equals 0, for example. Then this method would be kind of bad because you're going to get the x-intercept to 0, the y-intercept to 0, and you only have one point. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so that, sometimes this method is not great. It probably isn't the one that you're most used to either, is it? What one are you most used to? You find the y-intercept and you do rise over run, right? Okay. So roughly speaking, so and using that, you use this thing called the slope. So if you have a slope, what does it measure in a line? Like, what does it tell you? Steepness. Tell you the steepness, like how fast the line is going up or down. Bigger slopes, more steep. It's kind of like grade in a road, right? Like if your road has 6% grade, that is a slope of the road. Does that make sense? Which means climbing your bicycle is very painful. Um, what is the change in x usually called? So think x is horizontal, right? Is that the rise or is that the run? Run. And what's the change in y called? The rise. And I probably should have put that formula first. Columns got a little messed up, but what does the picture of a graph that has positive slope look like? As it goes from left to right, what happens to the picture? It goes up. So A goes up. That's a positive slope. How about negative slope? What does that look like? Yeah. Goes down. Zero slope, what does that look like? Just a flat line. Just a flat line. Yep. 
And the point is there's zero rise over lots of run, right? How about undefined slope? Yeah, so that's a vertical line. And the reason it's called undefined is that's lots of rise over how much run would you have? Zero. Some books also call this infinite slope. You can kind of think like it's, you've got your steepness is, you know, that's the steepest you can get is like a rock cliff face. You've got to like climb up it. Okay. And mostly those, I want you to use them for like, if you're graphing a line, your slope is negative, your ending picture should look like that second one. Does that make sense? Like use that litmus test to tell you like, oh yeah, of course my picture looks like this, not like the other thing. But what is the formula for slope? In general, it's rise over run, right? And so if you think about a picture, is rising the y part or is rising the x part? That's the y part. So that's change in y over change in x. And what you guys actually kind of remembered the formula earlier. You were like, oh, it's that formula with y's, y2's, and y1's. What, what is it? So the rise, that's called y2 minus y1. And the run is x2 minus x1. That's in your second x minus your first x is how much you've ran. And how much you've risen is the top y minus the bottom y. Does the order matter in that thing? It actually doesn't as long as you're consistent. So if you said y1 minus y2 over x1 minus x2, it'll reverse both of the signs, which will end up canceling out in the end. So the order isn't a problem as long as if you choose to put your second coordinates first, they have to go first. If you choose to put your first coordinates first, they have to be the ones that go first in both the top and the bottom of the fraction. Okay, so, here we go. All right, so find the slope of the line through each pair of points. Do not graph. <coughs> you can graph to verify what's right, but let's just find the slope. So the formula is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So what goes in for y2? Mm -hmm. And then we're going to have minus another negative 3, right? All over 2 minus negative 3. If you want to change those double negatives to positives right away, I don't care. What's your numerator going to actually be? Zero. Mm -hmm. So 0 over 5. Is that 0 or is that undefined? Zero. That's 0. So you're going to have some kind of horizontal line of some sorts, except for it's not up there, it's down there. Okay, try part B because it's super easy, you guys can totally do this. Did anybody ever wonder why the letter used for slope is M? As opposed to like S or something that would make more sense? Yeah, yeah apparently no one knows. So that's hard for the let down, but no one knows why they use M. I think it was like just a letter that wasn't used up by other stuff. Okay, how about this one? So you got negative 1 minus 2, right? Over negative 3, it'd be plus or minus 3? Plus. So you get negative 3 over 0, and what's that one? Undefined. Undefined. Which means if you were to graph it, you would get a vertical line, right? Okay. Awesome. All right, so now we're going to move on to your favorite form. You ready for it? So your favorite and the most common form says that an equation of the line with slope m and y-intercept b is given by what? y equals mx plus b. And that's called slope-intercept form because you can look at the equation and very easily tell what your slope is and what your intercept is. And should be a little bit careful which intercept is it. Is it the x-intercept or the y-intercept? 
the y-intercept. You could verify that by plugging in x equals 0, and you get y equals b. Does that make sense? Okay. So write the slope-intercept form of the equation of the line with the following slope and y-intercept, and then graph it. So if my slope is 2 thirds and my y-intercept is negative 5, what is the equation of the line? Y plus 2 over 3x minus 5. 2 over 3x minus 5. There you go. That's it. <clears throat> now, to graph lines using slope-intercept form, we always begin at the y-intercept. So the starting point, which in this case is negative 5. And then from there, just before you graph things, should your line go up or should it go down? Up. It should go up because it's got positive slope, right? So how much to get the next point do you rise? Three. Two, and you run? Three. three. Is it also legitimate to go down two and backwards three? Mm -hmm. And the reason that that's okay is that's the same thing as negative two over negative three, which is the same thing as positive two-thirds, mm -hmm. right? So... You really only need two points, but there you go. Yay, straight edges. Credit cards and um, UAIDs make spectacular straight edges, too. Okay, so how about this one? The slope is negative 2, the line intercept is 2, so what's the equation? Negative 2x plus 2. Okay. So you start at 2 on the y axis. And the slope is negative 2. So do I go down 2 and backwards 1? I've got to go down 2 and forwards 1. If you go down 2 and backwards 1, your line won't be decreasing. Right? It's going to be increasing. So down 2, forwards 1. Also, you can think negative 2 is negative 2 over positive 1, right? If you put two negative signs there, you're going to end up with a positive number in the end. So there is your line. Okay, so that form is like the best for graphing. One thing you're going to have to do like a whole lot in calculus, this will not go away. Okay, so if you don't like it, don't ignore it, figure it out, is find equations of lines. And pretty much everybody to find equations of lines is going to use this point-slope form. So the point-slope form is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Have you guys seen that before? No. Okay. Has your, is it possible that your teacher has used y equals mx plus b to find equations of lines? Maybe. Maybe? Okay. I'll show you both ways, but this way is definitely better. So, doesn't this, hmm, you're like, we, another formula, y. This is actually, this comes from the slope formula. So, does it make sense that with a line, the slope is the same no matter what two points you use? Okay. And so, if you have one point x1, y1, and any other x, y, does it make sense that y minus y1 e over x minus x1 has to equal your slope m? Yes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then can you see how the equation that I wrote down above just came from this? Mm -hmm. You just multiply by x minus x1, and you get y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So that's just the slope formula rewritten with one point and you know the slope, okay? So in this formula, these things are all specific numbers. And then the x and y are variables, okay? And you use this, if you know a slope and y-intercept, to get or a slope and just a general point that might not be an intercept to get an equation. So, for example, find an equation for a line that has this slope and goes through that point, which is not the y-intercept. So what you do is you take your slope-intercept form, and you just input your information. So you're supposed to input the slope and then a point. So what's, what goes in for m? Negative 2 fifths. Mm -hmm. And what goes in for y1 and x1? 3 and negative 2. Mm -hmm. Who goes in for y1 specifically? Negative 2. So that becomes y minus negative 2 equals negative 2 fifths times x minus 3. 
upset. Okay. Let's just simplify a little and say that's y plus 2 equals negative 2 fifths times x minus 3. Okay, so they say to write the final answer in standard form, which means they want it to be like that ax plus by equals c form. So if you were going to have to do that, what would you want to do next? Say that again? You could subtract the 2, but the thing is you still have that. I would distribute first. Let's do that. So y plus 2 equals negative 2 fifths x. Then I'll have plus how much? 6 over 5. Great. And I don't know about you, but uh, fractions, UE, want to get rid of them? Sure. How would we, how would we do to get rid of them? Multiply by 5. Multiply by 5. On, on both sides of the equation, right? So on the left side, we have 5y plus 10 equals negative 2x plus 6. Okay, and then standard form has the x's on one side and the x's and y's on one side and the numbers on the other. So if I say 2x plus 5y equals negative 4, does it make sense how I got that? Yes, okay. So standard form is a little bit special in that it's a form that's not unique. And what I mean by that is that you can write this answer lots of different ways, like that is the exact same thing as negative 2x minus 5y equals 4, right? Or it's the same thing as 4x plus 10y equals negative 8. Does that make sense how that's the same as well? So if you really want to torture your grader, you could all come up with a different way to write your answers and have to make the person check and see if they're equivalent. Okay, which is a little bit, like, just a little bit annoying about it. Hopefully... Alex is smart enough that it, like, you know, it should be smart enough to catch if you give it a different form. It wouldn't, don't, don't try to test it too much. You know, it's kind of like poking your parents when you shouldn't do that. Yeah? Is the answer in standard form, I thought it was going to have to be y equals mx plus b? I asked you got to know your names. y equals mx plus b is slope-intercept form. Okay. And you can, and the reason, what you can think about is slope-intercept form is the one you can look at and see, there's my slope, there's my intercept. As in, that is the one that is used most commonly. I totally get that. So you can't change it into that form? Oh, you totally can, but just the directions don't ask for that. Okay, so I'm asking for standard form. What was it again? For standard form was AX plus BY equals C. So that's the one where the X's and Y's are on the same side. Most of the time, I want you to have your answers in slope-intercept form. I mean, like, really, that's what we want most of the time. So, like, for example, this one. So, find an equation of a line that passes through these two points and write the answer in slope-intercept form. So, to plug in to point slope, I need a point and a slope. I have two points, and you're like, you cheater. You give me a slope. But, can you find a slope? Yeah, okay, so step one is to get slope. So m is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So that's negative 3 minus 1 over 7 plus 3, which is what? Uh-huh. Or reduced negative 2 over 5. Great. And now here's the interesting thing. When you plug into point slope now, you can plug either point in, and they're going to give you the same answer as you solve for y. So your work might look different, but as long as you do it correctly, whatever, you're going to get the same answer as all your friends. I would suggest plugging in the point that has the smaller numbers. If one point contains a zero, plug that one in. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's plug in this first one. So y minus 1 equals negative 2 fifths. Can I just say x plus 3 right away? So that's y minus 1 equals negative 2 fifths x plus minus 6 fifths, right? Mm -hmm. OK. 
Okay, then I'm gonna add one to both sides. Hello, train. So negative six fifths plus one. One is five fifths. So what's that gonna equal? One fifth. Uh huh. Negative, negative one fifth. The train must be trying to scare a moose off the tracks. And so that's a slope intercept form. When you have something solved for y, that's what is slope intercept form. Okay, how about the next one? It's a bit tricky. I gave you two points, but I didn't give them to you in quite the most useful way. Gavin, are you done writing? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Hey, yeah, I gave you the x-intercept and the y-intercept, but you need to find the slope, right? So what are those ordered pairs? Zero, or, yeah, zero, negative five. Okay, zero, negative five is the y-intercept. Great. Um, what's the other one? Four zero. But that wouldn't trick you guys, right? Maybe just think a little bit. Okay. So first find slope. So y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So zero plus five over four minus zero. So it looks like the slope is Five over four. <laughs> Which one's easier to plug in, the zero negative five or the four zero? Uh, the four zero. I actually think this one is. Let me show you why. It becomes y plus five equals five quarters just times x because it'd be x minus zero versus, although the other one's not really bad either, y minus zero equals five quarters times x minus four. Same thing, right? So the first one that I wrote will give you y equals five quarters x minus five, right? And the second one, you have to do five quarters times four, which is not so bad. What is five quarters times four? Five, so just, that's also, so either one's okay, you also could have said, hey, you said the y-intercept was negative 5. My slope is 5 quarters, right? So using the fact that this is, that b is the y-intercept, you can just plug in negative 5 there as well, right? You just plug it into the uh, standard form and then convert it to slope. Plug it into standard form. Oh, no, but you couldn't because those numbers in front of the standard form things are not intercepts. So I think what you want to do, and it's definitely wrong, is you have ax plus by equals c, and what do you want to do? Plug in. Plug, plug in what where? I would plug in um, 5 for, y, for x and uh, negative, uh, no, negative 5 for x and 4 for y. Mm-hmm. Why would why why would it equal the product of the two? I don't know. Exactly. So mm -mm. there are two separate points, and you can probably technically plug in zero yeah, negative exactly. five. It's it's wrong. I, I it's did, just I, I did plug in negative twenty. For, uh, if it worked, it's just because you were lucky. Okay. Okay. It's not actually going to always work. Those those a the a's and b's and c's don't have any easy relationship with the x and y intercepts. Okay, so I, I think it's because I saw in the previous examples, um, b and a always multiply to equal c. Mm-hmm. Is that always true? I don't think that's always true. I think that was I think that was they were special divisible ones because like you could have say x plus y equals 2 is also standard form, and x 1 times 1 doesn't make 2. Yeah. yeah, so no, that's definitely not, that. that's only the case because I made those specifically so that they would graph well using intercepts. And so if that happens, they often multiply, they don't, multiplying to the number on the right is an easy way to make that happen. Okay. Sometimes when I make patterns, I don't realize I'm doing it. So, okay, so now these lines, x equals 4 and y equals something on the next page. I mean, it's easy, but so you want all the points where x is 4. 
So I'm going to draw two lines, and one of them is right. It's either this or it's this. And think to yourself for a second, on one of those lines, every single time the x-coordinate is 2, 4, which is, is the first one I drew. Yeah, the vertical line is the place where every single point on there has x equals 4. The other one's wrong. So we're going to erase it. Like the grid line just disappeared because it was sad. And the fact that there is no specification about y means that y can be any specific numbers. You're just all the points that are over 4. And using that pattern, what would y equals negative 5 be? All the points that are... Parallel to the x-axis minus 5. Mm -hmm, minus 5. So all the points that are down 5. Okay, so for using that reasoning, what is the x-axis as an equation? Is the x-axis x equals 0 or is it y equals 0? It's y equals 0. And then how about the y-axis? What is that as an equation? It's x equals 0, right? So the x-axis is all the points that are up nothing but over whatever, and the y-axis is all the points that are over, over nothing but up whatever. Okay. So the last couple things are a couple parallel and perpendicular lines and then just a few applied examples. So if two lines are parallel, so parallel means they never cross, the slopes are the same. That one's pretty obvious, right? Uh, perpendicular is a little bit trickier. So first of all, do you guys know what perpendicular means? They intersect at right angles, yep. Okay, and so does it make sense from the picture that at least one thing that's true is the slopes have different signs? The slopes are opposite. Yeah, they're opposite in a very particular way because you've got to be careful you use the word opposite because there are lots of opposites. Like the opposite of positive one is negative one if you're adding, but not if you're multiplying. So the slopes are negative reciprocals. Reciprocal. And that's kind of like two opposites. It's the opposite sign, it's also the reciprocal of whatever the original slope was as a fraction. So, for example, like if your m was two fifths, the perpendicular slope would be opposite fraction and opposite sign, so negative five halves. Does that make sense? And that's just a pattern you're gonna have to remember for the time being. Parallel is easy, perpendicular, a little bit trickier. Okay. So suppose I have this line L, that's 4x plus 2y equals 3, and I have this point 2, negative 3. I want you to find the equation of a line that's through the point that is parallel to L. So the first thing you have to figure out is, well, what is the slope of L, right? How would you figure out L's slope? Isolate, and by it specifically, you mean the y. y. Great. So that would be 2y equals negative 4x plus 3. And then what do you do next to isolate the y? Divide by 2. Okay, so y equals negative 2x plus 3 halves. So the slope is... Negative 2. Mm-hmm. And does this 3 halves matter for finding your equation really at all? No. no, it's kind of extra information. So you have that slope, and you have this point 2 comma negative 3. So now you can use point slope form to get the equation of your line. So y minus y1 equals mx minus x1. And so is using that form easier than flipping the... I think, let me finish, and I'll show you what I think you mean, okay? And we'll see if it's right. So y plus 3 equals negative 2, x minus 2. So y plus 3 equals negative 2x plus 4. Does that make sense? And so what's your final answer? y equals negative 2x 
plus one. Okay. Now it is possible, like have, I am probably, I'm pretty certain that all of you didn't see equations of lines found that way. Did anybody learn this way? You said, okay, I have y equals mx plus b is a line. I know my slope is negative two. Is that true? And then you said, I have the other point that's an x and a y. And I said, negative three equals negative two times two plus b. And you can solve for b. And you get negative three equals negative four plus b, right? And so therefore, b equals one, right? And your final answer is negative two x plus one. Plus have you guys seen that way? So that's totally fine. That way is all right. Every single calc teacher that I've seen has done it this way because the solving is just a little bit faster. Does that make sense? Like, I, I think that getting the equation into its final form is a little bit faster. And you also don't have students who just stop right there and then don't actually give them the equation of the line. Does that make sense? So what you can do, and they're going to give you the same answers. The problem is, is that every single calc teacher that I know does it this way. And if you're going to take calculus, you don't want to go into class and be like, oh my god, I don't get that way, right? So get used to using the second way. If you say you're taking a test or a quiz and you're uncertain, you got some spare time, check it the other way. Does that make sense? Because they're going to do the same thing. So it's, it'd be good, it's definitely good to know more than one method. It's just that I know that this is what all of us use. And I know for me, I was like, you guys, I learned this way. And I got to calculus and I was like, what the heck is he doing? I don't understand. I would just do it my way and just ignore the teacher. But that's not a spectacular method in case they want it the other way. And then another reason is that I used to teach AP calculus. And occasionally on their multiple choice tests, they would only give the answer like this. So my students weren't allowed to not know that form. Does that, otherwise they have to take all the multiple choice answers, multiply them all out, and see which one matched theirs. Does that make sense as also? So, so I'm gonna do it this way just because I think it'll be good for you guys to get used to it. But if you wanna check your answers or on your homework, you can do that other way as completely equivalent and also correct. I can't dock you for being different. Unless I ask for this way, then I can. Okay. So how about same thing, but perpendicular? So we did the whole finding the slope of L in the previous part of the example, right? What did we get for um, M for L? Negative two. M was negative 2. So for the perpendicular, M will equal positive 1 half, right? Opposite sign, opposite fraction. And the best way to get used to that point-slope formula is to Write it down whenever you do a problem, even though it's tedious and takes like five seconds. You'll have it memorized if you, if you don't want to. When your kids are in school someday, like 20 years from now, you'll be like, yay, I know that form. Okay, so you got y plus 3 equals 1 half x minus 2, right? So what happens when you distribute the 1 half? You get one half x minus one. And so you take away three now and your final answer is one half x minus four. Technically also, here's a kind of cool thing. If I don't ask for you to put your line into slope intercept form, you can actually stop here. Like you can lawyer me. You can say, well, you didn't say to solve for y, so I don't have to solve for y. So I've got to be very specific about how I ask for things in my directions. Yes? Alex counted me wrong for using did it say? Did it say to put the line in slope-intercept form? Yeah, it asked you to put it into slope-intercept form. Okay, that's good to know. So, but did the directions before you, um, did the directions say to do that or not? I can't remember. Okay. Because I'd be interested to know what, what they were saying about that. But the one other problem with this, slope in, this point slope form is it's also not unique. As in, like, there are lots of different ways to be right and put, like, a because any point works. So my guess is to make it easier for their system to check. You, you're right. They probably want you to solve for y. That's my suspicion. But thank you for telling me. But if it was a quiz that I was grading and I didn't specify, you don't have to solve for y unless I say to do so but Alex might make you. It's tricky Alex. 
Okay, so a couple of applied examples and then we'll be done for the day. So sometimes, so the easiest equations that you can get are things where you're given the slope and y-intercept. Does that idea make sense? And then there are a couple others where you're given, say, two points and you've got to find the slope. So this is an example of the first kind, the really easy one. So you are, you're a pretzel vendor, and I don't know why this is your job, but we're going to pretend that it is. And it costs you 20 bucks each day to rent the cart, and each pretzel costs you 75 cents to buy. So you want to figure out an equation that tells you the cost of selling X pretzels in one day. So how much do you pay if you sell no pretzels? $20. That's your y-intercept. And then the slope is how much your cost increases per pretzel, which is 0.75. So that equation is y equals 0.75x plus 20. Or if you want to use different letters, you could say C equals 0.75P plus 20. No, C for cost, P for pretzel. If a, like a software like Alex asks you to use specific letters, you probably should use those specific letters in your final answer. But I mean, as long as you can keep track of what X and Y are, maybe it'd be good to say, you know, X equals number of pretzels and Y equals total cost to you. So what is the cost of selling 150 pretzels in one day? How would you figure that out? Mm -hmm. So 0.75 times 150, and then you have to add in the 20, and you're totally welcome to use a calculator. 132.5. Okay. And how about if your boss, you know, he was counting, he said, okay, you owe me 275 and you want to know, okay, well, how many pretzels did I actually sell? How do you figure that out? Minus by 20. Or you can set it equal to um, yeah, you 275. Yeah, you set 275 equal to 0.75x plus 20, right? And then the first thing you do is take away 20 and you get 255, right? And how many pretzels did you sell? Say it again. You were busy. Okay. How did you create a equation that would account for more than one day? How would you create an equation that counted for more than one day? Well, that 20 would just become 40. So a way to do that, it would have three variables, but I think it could be 0.75x plus 20d. And but the thing is, then all of a sudden, it's no longer a, it's no longer a two-dimensional thing; it's a three-dimensional thing, because you've got three variables. So you have to restrict yourself to one day so that you can actually talk about it as a line. Okay. Yeah, that's why they specified that. Okay. So here's another, but this one's a little bit harder. So after n about nine hours of a steady wind, the height of waves in the ocean is approximately linear related to the duration of the time the wind's been blowing. So during a storm with 50 knot winds, the wave height after nine hours is 23 feet. After 24 hours of the wind blowing at the same speed, it's at 40 feet. So if T is the time after the 50 knot wind started to blow, and h is the wave height, write a linear equation that versus the height in terms of time t. So does it make sense that t is like x and h is like y? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that for now. I'm gonna like actually use x instead of t, and I'm gonna use y instead of h until my final answer when I plug t and h in. Does that make sense? Okay, so what they gave you were two points. They said, after nine hours, how tall are your, how was the height of your waves? So nine comma 23 is one point that they gave you. What's the other point that they gave you? 24 and 40, exactly. 
And the fact that the problem says that these things are about linearly related means that it makes sense to talk about an equation of <coughs> a line. So in which case, you have two points. Now you need to find the slope. So that's 40 minus 23 over 24 minus 9. So I think that's 17 over 15, is that right? Can't you reduce um, uh, 24, 40? No, PEMDAS. Oh, yeah. Those fraction bars act like parentheses. You can prove some crazy stuff, like probably 2 equals 1 if you use that rule. So does 17, 15 make sense? Yes. So you chose T equals X, mm -hmm. H equals Y. Mm -hmm. It technically wouldn't, but you're, the, you might still be counted wrong because the final, it does say height in terms of time t, and that vocabulary means that h is your y. Does that make sense? As long as you keep track of what's what, and in the end then solve for h, then you wouldn't have a problem. That is the hardest thing with this, these kinds of questions is that it's hardest to know what variable they want to be x and y, Time is almost always x, almost always. And then there's other vocabulary that says, like, write height as a function of time, and that comes from the whole y as a function of x stuff. So, yeah, that's the hardest thing about word problems. And I assume that we're going to talk about that more tomorrow because we're talking specifically about applied stuff, like how to choose x and y. But I don't think it's wrong as long as you know what your variables stand for. Does that also make sense? Okay, it's a great question. I estimated that to be about, with a calculator, 1.133. So, and then plug it into point slope. So y minus 23 equals 1.133 x minus 9, right? So y minus 23 equals 1.133x. What's 9 times 1.33? 3. I got 10.2. Tell me if you got that too. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I made a boo-boo in my notes here because I added 23, but I did it wrong. So... 10, negative 10.2 plus 23, what's that going to make? 12.8. Okay, and then the question did ask for H's and T's, so your final step should be to say, okay, H equals 1.133T plus 12.8. Web assign, sorry, calculus, mixing them up. Alex will definitely count you wrong if you don't use the right variables. Since you um, defined that t equals x and h. If it's a computer system, you have to give it the right yes. variables. If it was me and you defined what x and y were, you don't have to change. That's totally true. But if it's a computer system, you have to give it the letters it asked for. Just yeah. I yeah. know in science, like, when there's three points after the decimal, mm -hmm. then you have to carry out the whatever you times it by the three decimal points. Yeah. Do we, do we have to do that on the computer? Or it's, it, okay? it just depends on what... Alex's tolerance is on the accuracy of your answers. Does that make sense? Like, I don't know if you're off by like a couple decimal places, is it going to count you wrong or not? Certain systems have more tolerance for being a little bit off because of your <coughs> calculation. So I'd say it probably is best to use a lot of decimal places in the initial calculations and then round your final answer. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is you're off on 23 and it's just 23. Oh, no, no. In my notes, when I like to, my, I, I always do the notes before I teach them. When I add twenty, when I added twenty three here, I said that it was thirty three point two. Like, see how I just boo booed. Oh, okay. So okay. that's why I said I need you to add for me because I added wrong. Oh, I, got it. Okay. I'm yeah. Sorry. No, no, I didn't mess up here. I messed up there. Okay. And then the last question: Is it still right if you leave it in factored form? If you leave it in, oh, yeah, 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 if you leave it in fraction form, it's totally right. Yeah, you can totally leave the answers in fraction form. Mm -hmm. And your answer, like, will be even more accurate, actually. 
there are definitely some examples of things where you don't want to round, and if you do, big errors happen. Um, a really common example of that is um, investing money. And we'll do that when we talk. I'll show you the example. If you round to like two decimal places, you can like end up with like thousands of dollars of less money over the course of not very much time. It's like banks don't round. They carry all the digits. He's to a point. Oh, sorry. So how long will the wind have been blowing for the waves to be 50 feet high? So you have this equation. That's H equals 1.133 T. Oh gosh, what was it? Plus 12.8. 12.8. So where does that 50 go in? At the H. Oh shoot, 50 equals 1.133 T plus 12.8. And then can you solve that for t if you have to? 47.2. Uh, I, I, so first you take away 12.8 and you get 32, 30, yeah, 32. I think it's 30, 37.2 equals 1.133t. And then after that you take and divide by, uh-huh, and you get t is approximately equal to, 32 point, how many, let's say? 8331862. So we'll say 833 hours. I'm sure that, have you guys had questions? Does Alex specify how you should round your answers at the end? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just follow directions. Okay, so that's it for today.